Okay, so let's get started. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, session five of this series. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. I was just saying to Mark that after reading uh, the book One of Your Idol, um, I'm really getting the sense that I'm I'm watching a, a slow motion recording of a train wreck, and uh, we'll see where it all leads uh, uh, in two weeks. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Uh, the game plan is he's going to talk for 20 or 30 minutes and then uh, solicit questions and comments from you folks. And as usual, you know, use the Q&A button for that, and then I'll uh, pass them along to Mark. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark, and we'll get started. Uh, thank you, Michael, as always, for the invitation, and thank you all for showing up. Let me say that one of the challenges tonight is that Guinevere as a character, as a legend, as an idea, is much bigger than this short idol. This idol is half the length of Lancelot and Elaine. And one of my friends and book group people, Elizabeth, who I believe is here tonight, uh, had an exchange with me earlier this week. And I just want to say to her and to everybody, if questions persist after tonight's presentation, please do write me. But the challenge tonight is to talk about the Guinevere that's in this poem and not the Guinevere that we know from other contexts. So uh, Guinevere's first appearance um, in popular literature was well before uh, the 15th century, late 15th century Mallor Mallory. Uh, she appeared for the first time in the early 12th century in Geoffrey of Monmouth's history of the kings of Britain, Ireland, and Scotland. And in that version, more or less the first version she ha we have, uh, she is seduced by Mordred in his battle against Arthur. Uh, in the Mallory version, which Tennyson is using slightly, but most of this idol is original to Tennyson, there is a battle between Lancelot and Mordred that's more serious than just knocking him off the wall when he's looking uh, spying on uh, Guinevere. Uh, but that happens many books before the issue of Guinevere in the convent. And in, in Mallory, she doesn't go to the convent until after Arthur's dead. Arthur never appears in the convent. And what's more, um, he, when he discovers and has confirmed that his wife has been faithful, he sentenced her to death by burning which is something that was done typically to women. People who were thought to be um, noble, like male traders who once were loyal subjects but no longer, they were typically had their throats cut or they were hanged or not hanged, they were beheaded. Um, but women were burned. Why? Because it hurts a lot. Uh, and they tried to suffer, uh, make them suffer more. So in Mallory... Uh, she is condemned to be burned. Lancelot hears this. He gets together a group of knights. They rescue uh, Guinevere. This is all in Mallory, 15th century. Remember, Mallory is writing a version that he hopes will become a national legend uh, for England. He's doing it from the French source because the French source is the most complete. He decides to return Guinevere to Arthur. Arthur um, doesn't push through with the burning, uh, and he dies shortly thereafter, uh, having been wounded by Modred. And when he dies, Guinevere decides to go off to Almsbury with some of her ladies, uh, and she is never visited uh, by Arthur at all. He's dead. When Lancelot hears that she's there, he goes to visit her. He's impressed by her piety, and he gets the idea that he should become a priest, that he should do what she had done. Now, remember, this is somebody writing for the national heritage of the legend. So Arthur dies in battle. Um, he doesn't get a chance to scold Guinevere. Guinevere does the right and pious thing and takes on the black and white. Black and white of the um, habit is mentioned in Mallory. It's repeated by Tennyson. Um, the white was for purity, the black is for the death of worldly things. And even Lancelot becomes uh, a monk, essentially a priest. Um, and that's because the times demanded, from Mallory's point of view, 
that these people represent a good thing. There are so many different versions of the Guinevere myth, and one of them, uh, she's going to be, uh, there's a plot to replace her with her evil twin. No kidding. Uh, this isn't even a TV show, of an evil twin. In another one, she has a uh, ongoing feud with Arthur's sister, Morgan Le Fay. Um, this is what happens when legends are fed by lots of different people from lots of perspectives. And I want to say the challenge tonight is, what is the glitter that we have? And I want to talk about some of the literary aspects of this idol, even though many of you, I suspect, um, there are some 30 of you in the room right now, will want to talk about issues more broadly. And I want to make it clear, one of the great joys of literature is you can talk about anything that comes into your head in politics, in science, in culture, when you read a work. But what we're doing in these six one-hour meetings is we're trying to read the text that's in front of us. So the text that's in front of us begins, as I mentioned in one of my talks earlier, with the name of the person the idol is about. It begins with Queen Guinevere, and you see she's fled the court, Fled is repeated several times before the idol. And notice that in this first paragraph, there's low light. Things are blurred. Things are misty. The moon is unseen. The mist appears again. It seems as if they uh, have a lace cloth to the face, a kind of veil. Then there's a break in the text. And we're told again, she fled the cause of her flight. Uh, and there's a little bit of a uh, history about the Saxons. Those are the lords of the white horse. And at the end of that second paragraph, there's the word Lancelot. So this last idol, uh, other than the passing of Arthur, which is an idol, but not the same of the same kind, Queen Guinevere and Lancelot are separated by 20 lines of poetry. Uh, they are no longer a couple. And then the next paragraph, In addition, completely, where he knocks Modred down, um, he smites him on his knees and smiles. Um, he rankled him, he ruffled him. There's references to scorn. Um, there's not a whole lot uh, about the actual hatred uh, that um, Modred has for Lancelot that worries Lancelot. And you may notice that there are the long eyes of rising, twice, thrice, smiled. A lot of that rhyme uh, in the poem. If you look over to uh, the when Sir Lancelot told the matter to the queen and read down, we have the long E of creaking, of keeps, of dreamed, of dream, of seemed. Um, again, uh, Tennyson is trying to avoid end-line rhymes, but he's using a lot of internal rhyme, alliteration, assonance, and consonant. So what are some of the things that this idol is going to do from Tennyson's point of view? Tennyson's a Victorian, and he requires from his own view that Lancelot, I'm sorry, that King Arthur make a judgment about Guinevere. It's not enough that she gets herself to a nunnery, he has to uh, declare a moral judgment about her. So the first thing we notice is that we have uh, Guinevere and Lancelot joined, but not so closely together. Then we have the scene between Guinevere and the novice maid. It's that novice maid, not knowing she's talking to the queen as she talks about the queen, he refers to the queen as wicked. And uh, it's an open question about whether we should think that a cloistered young novice knows anything about what wickedness means. And even Guinevere, before she reveals herself, makes that point. You know, what, what do you know about what things are? Guinevere certainly thinks she's sinful, and it's possible for anybody reading the poem to think of her as wicked. But the fact that the novice refers to her, not knowing that she's talking to the queen as wicked, 
shouldn't hold a lot of water for us. I will also say that it's a long tradition in literature that has monarchs that a monarch goes among his or her people, most typically it's a king, and does not reveal that they are who they are. Uh, it, it happens in uh, Henry V. It happens in a lot of myths and stories about um, Richard the Lionhearted returning from the Crusades early and masking his identity so that his evil brother, King John, doesn't know that he's in town. In some versions, he meets up with Robin, who was a dispossessed aristocrat, and Robin, who joins with Richard the Lionhearted. This idea that the king may walk among the people had a lot of legs for several reasons. One is, it's good drama. Secondly, it suggests that the king is one of us. And thirdly, it suggests that the common people can help the king uh, and that the dividing line between royalty and peasantry uh, can be crossed. So that meme is here when the queen, in disguise, uh, and she's only put herself in disguise because she doesn't want to call attention to herself. She did not specifically mislead this novice maid. She didn't know the maid was going to have the opinion that she has. But a good portion of this very short relative to the other idols, idol is that there's a dialogue between this novice maid and the queen. Finally, she knows who she is. And the third uh, issue, so Guinevere more or less with or without Lancelot, Guinevere with this maid, novice maid, uh, and then there's Guinevere and Arthur. Uh, dramaturgs and people who, who uh, study theatrical arts have an expression called an obligatory scene. So an obligatory scene is any scene that either by virtue of the genre you're writing, if you're writing a romance, somebody should get kissed. If you're writing a film noir, somebody should betray, be betrayed or shot, ideally in that order. Uh, or if you're writing a different kind of play, you can say when you read Romeo and Juliet, there has to be another scene between Romeo and Juliet beyond the balcony. There has to be, the playwright is obliged to have a scene with the two of them. Well, the way Tennyson is pitching this poem as a Victorian, wanting to warn his audience that we need to be uh, moral and courteous, Arthur makes the mistake of trying too hard, but his heart is in the right place. This poem requires, this idol, the whole poem requires that Arthur and Guinevere meet. But when they meet, she can't look at him. She's prostrate on the ground. Um, he is, in my view, uh, an absolute prig. He does forgive her, but he first says uh, that my flesh loathes your flesh. It's, it's hard to listen to a tone of forgiveness uh, after you hear that. And he comes off to my hearing as very smug and self-satisfied. And it puts me in mind of Paradise Lost, late 17th century, so we're talking about 200 years earlier, that when people who knew Milton, colleagues and other Puritans and other writers, knew that he was working on his great poem, Paradise Lost. Remember, I mentioned weeks ago that his first thought was that his great poem would be about the Arthur legend. And he decided he couldn't do enough with it of what he wanted to do. Well, when they heard he was working on the poem, the question was, would there be lines for God the Father? Would God the Father speak in Paradise Law? People knew that uh, Milton was a church-going, God-fearing Puritan. They didn't think that he would be impious, blasphemous in writing apart from God. They just wondered how he'd pick it, uh, pull it off artistically. And most people think, and I'm in this group, that he did a terrible job, that God the Father in Paradise Lost is vain and boring and uninteresting and something of a prig. Um, it is uh, a cliché among people who study Milton that although Milton knew that Satan was literally demonic, uh, he was a more interesting character to write about. And the artist in Milton overrode the Puritan in Milton 
and made Satan a much more interesting literary character than anybody else in the book. And certainly, God the Father doesn't come close. And so I do think one of the problems with this idol is that Arthur, who is not in Mallory, remember, talking to Guinevere, Arthur shows up to both forgive her but first indict her. Uh, in uh, Mallory, uh, Arthur dies before Guinevere goes to the convent. She goes to the convent now that he's dead. Um, Lancelot gets a vision in Mallory that he is to visit her there. Well, he visits her there, and that's where he tells her, I'm going to do what you did. I'm going to become a priest. And she likes that they're on the same page. Uh, and then he goes and he does priest stuff. And in a single night, he has three visions that he is to go to the convent, only 30 miles from where he is, to visit Guinevere. And when he gets there, she's dead. And he's been directed in the vision that when she dies, not knowing it would be so soon, he is to bury her beside King Arthur. Uh, he does that. He is so, at that burial, broken up that his treachery has ruined these two great people, Arthur and Guinevere, that he gets ill and does not recover. This is all Mallory, and he dies. And so in Mallory's authorized version for posterity, Arthur and Guinevere do not have this confrontation they have in Tennyson, but they are buried together as a couple. And Lancelot not only repents to the extent of becoming a priest, he dies heartbroken, not just from uh, the death of Guinevere as someone he loved, but from what he did to this excellent couple because that was the purpose in uh, Mallory. Tennyson is writing this poem, as I've said more than once, because he wants his fellow citizens to understand that um, they should aspire to something higher than just freedom and democracy. I've mentioned that he was a baron. I mentioned that he's aristocratic in a lot of his tastes, and although he was progressive, in terms of uh, scientific knowledge and wrote poems about a, a great variety of topics, he was terrified, as many people of his class and even upper-middle-class writers, that the move to give women and lower-class people more freedom, lower-class people to give them the vote, women to give them a more role in society, that the problem is that there'll be nobody to teach them what to do. The, the saying of the day was, if we let an average Englishman choose what he wants, who's going to teach them what they should want? It's a very big question. Tennyson, Carlyle, Rusk, and others were worried about it. And one of the things that uh, Arthur says in his long speech to uh, Guinevere, when he says, she's the root, root cause of this. It was all through thee doesn't take any blame on himself. And he says around line 507, Yet must I leave thee, woman, to thy shame. I hold that man the worst of public foes. That's a very severe statement. I hold that man the worst of public foes, who either for his own or children's sake, to save his blood from scandal, lets his wife, who he knows false, abide and rule the house. That's a Victorian male sentiment through and through. The worst kind of public enemy is a man who knows that his wife is no longer pure, but for the sake of appearances or for the children, two very different things, he lets her run the house. Uh, Tennyson wrote a poem in 1847 called The Princess, which was later on turned into a successful operetta musical comedy by Gilbert and Sullivan called Princess Ida, which is still performed today, uh, that is about the formation of a college, not a university college, but a kind of prep school, high school college for women. And uh, Tennyson's son believed that his father was making a statement about the need for feminism, for education, female education. 
most people don't read the poem as celebrating women. And people had pointed out that there are a number of poems in Tennyson, including great poems like Mariana or The Lady of Shalott, where women are isolated in an empty cottage or in a tower where they can see no one. The Lady of Shalott has heard a rumor that if she looks down on Camelot, she'll be destroyed. Why should that be true? There's no sense that she had done anything wrong. Sure enough, in the poem, she looks down and sees Lancelot riding by, and she basically loses the will to live, puts herself on a boat and a barge and sails on down to Camelot. Some people say that Tennyson was writing this vision of women to suggest that this is how society saw them, that they were Rapunzel-like, they were locked up and separated and isolated because society wasn't giving them uh, space and, and agency. More people, or at least more of the people I read, say this is Tennyson's own male Victorian bias that the woman's place is in a tower or in an isolated cottage. And the reason I say that is that if you wanted to make a case for Tennyson being more feminist in whatever way that word might mean in the late 19th century, he certainly had a chance with Guinevere. Uh, but she, you, you read this poem for the first time, maybe some of you are reading it for the first time, and you think, oh, I'm going to get to the next to last book, the next, the last book with a kind of actual character, uh, the continued plot of presentation. And Guinevere, who's appeared a lot slightly, and Arthur, who has not appeared much at all, are both in it. You think, oh, this is going to be his chance to pay Guinevere her due. Remember, in most legends of it, she met Lancelot and mistakenly thought that Lancelot was Arthur. Her father uh, uh, was uh, a king who was aided by Lancelot. And to thank Lancelot, he gives her his daughter, and as a dowry, he gives him the round table. That may not sound like a big gift, but remember, the, the round table was huge. And Lancelot, from France, is said to pick up Guinevere. Same thing happens with Tristram and Assault, you remember. And what happens as he's approaching, uh, Guinevere says the Welsh version of hubba hubba and thinks for the first part of their conversation that this is her future husband. And in some version, if they drink a drink, that it magically makes them fall in love. But more typically, she is smitten with a man she mistakenly thinks is her husband, and everything goes downhill from there. If Tennyson wanted to write something about the power of women in a poem that has Vivian, uh, that has Morgan Le Fay, Le Fay incidentally, um, and that gives Guinevere her own idol, he could have done a better job the job he does here. But Tennyson wants to give his message. He wants to give it in the voice of Arthur, and he wants people to know that although we will forgive people who are sinful, we won't let them seem like they're good when they're not. Uh, again, I hold that man the worst of public foes who does this. And in Shakespeare, I'm sorry, in Tennyson's day, when people were concerned about appearances, as they were in 100 years before, I know you think people always worry about how they look. Um, there, there's, a, uh, there's a book that must be 60 years old now, uh, called The Rise of the Respectable Classes. And if you don't study history, you may think that people were always worried about being respectable. The idea of being respectable didn't come into being until sometime in the 19th century. Earlier than that, you were either very well off, or you were upper middle class, or likely beyond that, you were um, nobility, and you didn't have to worry about what people thought about you because you didn't think about what they thought about you. And if you're anything lower than that, you had to worry about feeding your children and not being respectable. But by the end of the 19th century, you could appear to be wealthy without being wealthy. This is the issue in Dickens often. Uh, Compasson, uh, the man who is as guilty as Magwitch 
of crime, but he gets off because his oil is his hair is oiled and he has a clean collar. And Magwitch looks like a bum. And Magwitch in Great Expectations gets sent to Australia and Compasson gets off. These are the people who are involved with Miss Habersham. Compasson is the man who left Miss Habersham at the altar and leaves her in a home with a rotting wedding cake saying, Broken, broken. He looks like a gentleman, but he's not. If you can look like a gentleman, then appearances become important in the late 19th century in the way they hadn't before. And so the Victorian nature of Tennyson's program comes out in the way Arthur speaks to Guinevere. I'm going to say more about the idol, but I do want to say that part of the trajectory of the poem is I mentioned to you that Tennyson both loved the Middle Ages, loved the whole culture and feel of it at the same time that he thought it was licentious and there were plenty of things wrong with it. I had the good fortune yesterday afternoon to be in Fairfield talking to what seemed like 60 people about uh, the great Gatsby. And I pointed out that um, Fitzgerald, who was a great fan of Keats, believed in Keats's doctrine of negative capability. The negative is that you're able as an artist to erase your own feelings uh, and beliefs and biases in order to be capable of creating a character that's different from you. Keats said the great master of that was Shakespeare, that he could create people very unlike him. And Fitzgerald took it a step further and said that the highest intelligence is to hold in your mind two opposing ideas at the same time and still be able to function. And I gave the example that Fitzgerald both despised and loved the jazz age that he was part of. Uh, he was licentious and alcoholic, and he coined, uh, didn't coin, but popularized the phrase the jazz age. His wife was considered the first flapper. That doubleness in The Great Gatsby, where you have Nick taking one point of view and Gatsby another, uh, there's a doubleness in this poem, Tennyson's poem, where it is making moral judgments about what's wrong with Camelot, even as in the earliest idols, including most of the ones we read, it's a rollicking good story about damsels in distress and treachery and knights and fools. And then what happens is now we're getting to the end and the party's over. There's no more damsels in distress to talk about. And now, with only one idol left to go, Tennyson has to fish or cut bait, and he becomes not dramatic, that is, he doesn't have much of an interchange uh, of back and forth between Arthur and Guinevere. In fact, it's ironic. There's more back and forth between the novice maid who just showed up and Guinevere than husband and wife. Instead, he becomes didactic. This is what Oscar Wilde was mocking in The Importance of Being Earnest, that um, the non-artist moral teacher in Tennyson comes out here to say, this is what was wrong with Glenover. It all came through you. Now, remember, I forgive you, but let me first say that my flesh loathes your flesh. It's a pretty strong word. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to say that I first like any comments or questions from people about this idol as we've read it. And I will stop talking after that and leave time for people who want to say anything about Glenover more broadly. Okay, folks, you know how to use the Q&A button, and uh, I'll pass them along as they, as they can come in. One thing I mentioned to uh, to Mark before we got started was, and I read this for the first time t this afternoon. And when you don't know what's going to happen, when you're at the point where Arthur is speaking to Guinevere, you don't know what's going to happen. He he's absolutely scathing, and you think, "Wow, he's really going to tear her apart here," you know, rhetorically. Only to find out that he turns into this, I'm going to forgive you 1,000%. Uh, and there's just an interesting twist and also maybe uh, an attempt by Tennyson to make Arthur 
even better than perfect. Yeah, and let me add to that while we're waiting. I'll just say that uh, Guadalupe says after that forgiveness uh, that um, how am I not, what might I not have made of this fair world? This is around line 650. Had I but loved thy highest creature here, it was my duty to have loved the highest. It truly was my profit had I known. I should have loved the best man on earth. It would have been my pleasure had I seen. We need must love the highest when we see it, not Lancelot nor another. Well, that's bad poetry. That's bad literature. I think that's bad psychology. But that's the Victorian Tennyson saying, this is what should have happened. Earlier, he gives hints in Guinevere's complaints about the iciness and aloofness of Arthur. Yeah. Guinevere does not give herself an out, as she would if I were coaching her, that it's not all through her. And she goes on to say in one of the last stanzas that I must not scorn myself. He loves me still. Let no one dream but that he loves me still. She's quoting him exactly without knowing she's quoting him. She's getting her value, her self-esteem, by the fact that he loves her still. It's a, it's a terrible ending to this idol. It's very typically a Victorian, very typically Tennyson in his worst mode. Any business for me? I've got one here from Paul. Does Tennyson's moralistic condemnation of Guinevere damage the poem as a work of art? Well, that's a question for everybody who reads it. So I mentioned some time ago that the last tournament uh, is my favorite idol, and a bad penultimate idol doesn't ruin a great poem for me. Uh, Tennyson was someone who believed that art should be moral. That's one of the arguments that um, uh, Wilde had with art at the end of the century. He believed that morality had no place in art, that it was the role of the artist to be creative, and that when Wordsworth said at the beginning of the century, effectively, we need to make art out of our own lives. We need to be autobiographical. We need to get in touch with the part of me that's common to everybody. Walt Whitman did the same thing at mid-century with Song of Myself. It opens, I celebrate myself and sing myself and what you, I assume you shall assume. He didn't mean take for granted. He mean taking on. I am going to assume I'm going to don the robes of my own individuality. I'm going to sing myself and you should do the same. When uh, Oscar Wilde, contemplated that Wordsworth said we should make art out of our own lives. We should tell the truth. Oscar Wilde's response in an essay was, any idiot can tell the truth. It takes an artist to lie creatively. And so Oscar Wilde, partly because he was living a lie because of his circumstances, uh, except for his close associates, he was a closeted homosexual, semi-closeted, at a time when it could get you in a boatload of trouble, and eventually it did. He also believed that there was the artist to be creatively anarchic. And this is where we're moving into the modern age of the 20th century. Tennyson was quite different. Remember, in Dickens' days, when the, when, uh, the uh, morality keepers of Victorian England uh, had to put um, a family a man into Dennis' prison, they thought it was horrible to separate him from his family. So they put his wife and young children in with him. And they thought that was the main thing to do. So it's really everyone's uh, prerogative to decide whether, and, and people who are listening to me now, they have a very different feeling uh, about their moral, aesthetic reaction uh, to this idol. Here's the last stanza. Uh, she said, they took her to themselves, and she's still hoping, fearing, is it too yet too late? Remember, there's a whole sequence of a song about too late. Dwelt with them, that is the other nudge. Till in time their abbess died, and she, for her good deeds and her pure life, this is in Mallory too, and for the power of ministration in her, 
and likewise for the high rank she had borne, was chosen abbess there. An abbess lived for three brief years, and there an abbess passed to where beyond these voices there is peace. So abbess three times, there three times, a tip it's insistent. So what has she become? She's become the queen of the cloistered women. And another kind of isolation, another kind of tower. Uh, she does not get liberated. She fulfills a Victorian male's idea of the woman's role. You know, they were called, and it was meant to be a compliment, uh, angels in the house, uh, Victorian women. And the view was that because the industrial world, the urbanized world, the capitalist world became much more feral, uh, wars between the classes, doggy dog, that men had to go out into the urban workplace and they had to fight to make a living, which wasn't true in 17th century rural England or village England, and that the women were responsible for teaching the children to be cultured to sew if they're girls or sing or play music or art, they were the softening power of culture, of kindness, because the men had to be tough. And that separation uh, of sensibility that the men has to be stern and the women have to be kind uh, is predates the 19th century, but it comes into great clarity in the 19th century. So, Mark, Janet's uh, relating two, two different couples from two different works, saying that Hamlet has to lay a moral judgment on Ophelia, whom he loves, just as Arthur does on Guinevere. That's not a question, right? Just a comment. Yeah. Um, I, I want to say that in, in, this, in the time that I have in this late hour, that's a very complicated issue for me to cave up about Ophelia. Uh, if we think of her as a real person, which you're always invited to do, she is probably excessively loved by her brother. There's some suggestion that he has incestuous feelings about her. She certainly has a father who's a fool. She has no mother. Uh, she is a kind of waif, uh, and she becomes smitten with Hamlet, who decides to go wacko to pretend to be mad or actually be agitated, uh, and she doesn't know what to do. She's in over her head, and her mind is broken by that confusion. She is poorly uh, escorted by the company she keeps, uh, and I think that the, the judgment on her is, uh, woe is her. Um, she is one of the, uh, uh, what's the word, collateral damages in the play. You know, it's interesting to think about what are these characters as characters, not just as people. So you read King Lear, and at the end of the first act, you wonder, why is this guy such a big deal? He's a little demented. Literally, he's failing. Um, he doesn't know his good daughter from his bad daughters. He uh, uh, exiled one. He doesn't give the dowry to the person she's going to marry. He wishes her womb would dry up. When his trusted advisor, Kent, tells him you're doing something foolish, he exiles Kent. And you say to yourself, where is there anything kingly about King Lear? Why should we care about this uh, senile a selfish, egocentric monarch. And you have to step back and say, there was a King Lear before Act One. And what's the evidence of the king that he was? Kent serves him well. The best of his daughters, Cordelia, whose name means heart, the core in Cordelia is heart, is absolutely devoted to him. But she's as stubborn as he is, and she won't play the game of performing and so she gets voted off the island. She knows he loves her best. He knows it, but his pride gets in the way. So it is perfectly legitimate to say, from an understanding of the play, King Lear was a better father and king than the play opens. And they know that, Kent, Cordelia, the pool, even Edgar. We can intuit it, and we can have sympathy for him 
by knowing what he was like before the play. Uh, that, that's a fair literary inference about any work of art, and so especially so in drama, because the advantage that drama has over novels is these characters are actually people up on the stage. It may be hard for you to imagine Madame Bovary as an actual living, breathing human, human being, but Ophelia is right there as a woman with lines and limbs and clothing. Uh, it's harder to ignore her humanity than it is uh, in something like Madame Bovary or Anna Karenina. I don't mean the writing, I mean the genre, the genre. We've got a question from uh, from uh, Liz. After listening tonight, I am thinking that Tennyson's interpretation of Arthur and the story of Guinevere result in a weaker version of Arthur than that depicted by other versions of the Arthur story that preceded Tennyson. Is yeah. this a fair comment? Well, it's a, it's a reductive comment. Uh, when we say other versions of Arthur, you know, get your pen out. That's a long list. There are versions of Arthur where writers, in order to make Lancelot and Guinevere's adulterous relationship more palatable, paint Arthur to be a rogue. Uh, to be a failed human being. And so you say, well, what, what's a girl to do? The, the guy's a schmo. Here's this good-looking Frenchman. You know, this is a problem with legend. Uh, I couldn't begin to count how many different author legends there are. Um, Tennyson was interested in relying on Mallory because Mallory was the great forebear of the British national myth. Uh, but there is no consensus about... Um, which author, uh, even the many film versions, uh, Arthur is typically seen as a good but inattentive king. You know, um, there's not a lot of privacy in a castle. And uh, there, there's a lot of times in this poem when it mentions that the queen's room is dark, suggesting she is not staying in it. Um, and Arthur seems to be uh, so negligent of what's happening with his wife as to be inhuman. And where Tennyson gives hints of that earlier, most typically in the mouth of Guinevere, he abandons at the end because he has to wrap things up. And I don't think, I think that criticism is legitimate. Um, I don't think it uh, uh, eviscerates the entire poem. And we have another idol left to go. If you read it, you'll see what I mean, that more is coming. But certainly in my reading and in Tennyson's reading of the poem for more than the first, for most of it, is that Guinevere and Lancelot are certainly culpable, but King Arthur has tried to be too perfect himself and too perfect in what he set out to do. He is also very self-aggrandizing in reminding us that he beat back the heathen. Well, it turns out that aristocratic Christians can have a lot of heathen heart in them. That it's not just a matter of you you tame the beast and it's gone away. There is heathenness, uh, people of the heath, unsophistication, primitive feeling in people in the court as much as there are on the heath. You know, uh, yesterday, this is a busy week, I also had occasion in the evening to do a private Zoom group with a handful of people who wanted to have me talk about Macbeth because they are planning a trip uh, this month late or next month to see Ray Fiennes in Washington, D.C. perform in Macbeth. And these friends make a habit of seeing versions of Shakespeare plays. And so they hired me to do a little Macbeth talk. And inevitably, we got around to Lady Macbeth. And I was thinking at the time, knowing that I'd be here this evening talking to you, that that's another good character and a better example than Ophelia, even though I welcomed the comment earlier, that when you read Macbeth, it's impossible not to try to make sense of Lady Macbeth. And I have been at talks and I have talked to people in classes where you would think that the, poem, the play was called Lady Macbeth, where they are much more interested in Lady Macbeth than Macbeth. And they want to know, is she at fault? And what exactly is her nature? What can we know about her? Uh, and that's absolutely fair 
she's important in the play. Most important is not that she's egging Macbeth on. He seems like he'd be pretty good even if he was single with being ambitious. It's that it gives him something to plan with, someone to plot with, someone to get worried and share with him that he doesn't know if he can do this. And she gets to say, screw your courage to the sticking place. Guess he's a, she's a co-conspirator. She's a wife, but not a mother. She plays an important role in the play. But a lot of people, when they talk about Lady Macbeth, go well beyond the play, and not just in the way that I talked about King Lear before the play started. They see Macbeth, Lady Macbeth in ways that the play does not seem to support because this is how they read it. Now, I want to say again, you can do that. You can bring your own feelings about women or murder or marriage uh, to the play, and you can have a great discussion about that. But it doesn't make you a better reader of the play as the play. And so there's a temptation to do that with certain characters, male or female, who have a very important imprint on the player of the characters, even though it may not be as extensive as we think. Lady Macbeth still remains something of a cipher. She has humanity. She won't kill Duncan because he reminds her sleeping of her father. Uh, she's the one who becomes so guilty that she starts to see blood on her hands when it's not there. She gets a sickness where she cannot sleep. She loses her faculties. She winds up essentially killing herself. And she leaves the play relatively early. And part of her role is that she has now effectively abandoned Macbeth when he's at his lowest. And that's an important role. But she she is not capable of carrying a lot of the freight that people put on her as she's written in the play. And I want to say again, I am generous in what people want to do about how to read a play or a book or a poem. But I do try to insist in my courses, I'll call them, and let's go back to the text. So the fact that at the end of this idol, he says Abbas three times and here and here and here, I've said before with this repetition, there's a kind of insistence uh, that is um, not artistic, uh, not progressive. Um, you say it again and again, but you don't say more about it. She became an Abbas, an Abbas, an Abbas, and... What do you do with that except say he's being insistent? It's not a very elegant or poetic ending. And in fact, except for the mist and the gloom and the grief and the too late, a lot of darkness in this idol, it's not particularly poetical. T.S. Eliot was asked who he thought the saddest poet was in uh, English literature. Uh, you may know that he wrote a very influential essay called Tradition and the Individual Talent about the burden that any artist, and he always meant by artist a poet, had writing in the 20th century with the weight of all the other great poets behind them. How can you be an individual talent in the face of such a daunting tradition? And his response to who was the saddest poet was Tennyson. Uh, Tennyson wrote, wrote one of the great poems about grief in memoriam. You have to see that by the time this poem ends, it's very sad. There's a lot of sadness in this poem. And Tennyson was very good as a poet laureate of capturing the country's mood at the death of Wellington or uh, the Prince Consort, uh, Albert. Uh, he was very good um, at the lament about um, the condition of humanity in the 19th century. He's very much a poet of things that are past, a kind of elegiac poet. And the country, the time, was very interested in sadness. The 19th century believed that to be human was to be sentimental. That's what the romantics taught them. And the idea of celebrating loss, uh, you know, uh, Little Nell in the old curiosity shop takes several chapters to die. You may know the story, which may be apocryphal, that when the last edition that would tell whether she rallied in her deathbed or died was coming on a pack boat 
to a harbor in New York or Boston, I forget which, the crowd that was waiting to read it yelled out to the captain, does Nell live? And when they were told Nell is dead, they started weeping on the pier. To weep in public, to faint in public in the late 19th century was to show your humanity. Uh, Bo Brummel, a friend of George Gordon, Lord Byron, is supposedly the person who invented this gesture. It's just too painful to bear. I, I'm, I'm so emotionally connected. I feel the pain so deeply. You know, Clinton, I feel your pain. Uh, that, that was considered a sign of hum humanity. And that you needed several chapters for Nell to die was because you knew what your public wanted. And again, our friend, um, uh, sure, it'll come to me. Um, Oscar Wilde said that you had to have a heart of stone to read the many chapters of Nell dying and not laugh, uh, that, that it was just so over the top. And the sentimentality of 19th century literature, think of Heidi, who saved Grandpapa uh, from a life of being uh, angry with God, and who actually gets uh, Clara, wheelchair bed Clara, to walk. You don't need Jesus Christ to get a, a lame girl to walk. You've got Heidi. And even better if she's Shirley Temple. I'm only partly being glib. Uh, it, it is really very much over the top. And that was considered a mark of culture. So sadness becomes a value at the end of the 19th century. Very interesting. That's the, the we're, we're dry on the questions and f f for the moment, so you can continue. So I'll make another comment that I think is enlightening about Victorian culture. So uh, when people as a culture up until the early mid-19th century believed in an afterlife, but I'm talking now about Eng English society, but it includes America sometimes and Western Europe. When there was a general consensus in public that there was an afterlife, novels showed the death of a person and the leaving of that person by having a scene in a chapel or a church or a graveyard. The, the leaving of the dead girlfriend, hero, maybe even villain, uh, was done in some context of ritual. They were being buried. They were at a memorial service. They were at a funeral service. Later on in the century, you saw very few cemetery scenes of burials and even fewer church or chapel rituals. The way you left the character was at her deathbed, at his deathbed. When the lady of the camellias, Camille, dies of TB, <coughs> she dies on a deathbed, looking impossibly beautiful. In fact, there was a cult of the emaciated um, TB patient, almost always a female, being a so source of sort of ghostly beauty. So what happened was you no longer said goodbye to your loved one in a cemetery, a church, or a chapel because people didn't have confidence that they were going anywhere. People didn't have confidence that the right meant anything. Now, I'm talking very broadly. Of course, people still did those things. But the writers who wrote about dying put people in a deathbed. And the last time you saw them was home, dying, and maybe understanding that that was it. That was the end of it. It was Nietzsche who said near the end of the 19th century that God is dead. He said it in German, where it's a lot more emphatic, Gott ist tot. And most people at least worried that that might be true. John Ruskin, who was raised on the King James Version of the Bible, and like most of his contemporaries, was a, a devout a Christian, believed in the Bible, said that as his intelligence showed him what the geologists were revealing about the age of the earth, and that the scientific study of geology showed that Genesis could not be true, the earth could not be that young, and that when people said, how do you, uh, Bishop so-and-so, account for the fact that there are fossils being found 
in the Earth's layers that show that the Earth is older than the Bible version of it, that bishop said, God put those fossils there to test our faith. Um, outrageous, but that's what he said. Um, not science, but faith. And when people started to worry that they could not both be believing Christians and intelligent, rational people, there was a kind of crisis and, and breakdown. And John Ruskin said that he wanted to believe in the Bible, but when he read the Bible, he heard the geologist's hammers tinkling at the end of every verse, as if they were eroding the basis for belief. So Tennyson is ardently in favor of Victorian upper middle class courtly values. There is a distinct gender bias in it. Let me say that it didn't just end with the Victorians. I've mentioned earlier that the fall in the Garden of Eden undergirds a lot of this poem. The word, if you went through and circled every time fall is a noun or a verb, the action or the or the season, just extraordinary. And some of those times is explicitly the fall. And of course, that's one of the oldest stories in Western civilization. And it's Eve who takes the rap for that for all the reasons we understand, all the reasons we understand. Uh, Western culture and probably other cultures that I'm not as informed about don't know what to do with women's beauty and sexuality. They don't know what to do with men being undone by their own attraction to women they don't know, and thereby hangs a very long and complicated tale. So next time, the passing of Arthur, the coming of Arthur, was how the poem began. If you have a mind to read that too, you will see how many things are predicted in the coming of Arthur, the first idol, we didn't read it, and that are repeated or augmented in the last idol. Uh, those of you who are disappointed uh, that this idol is not more successful, all the other idols are still there. They haven't gone away. So... Great. Thanks, Mark. That was uh, very interesting, as usual. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And, and send uh, questions and comments if you have them. And Elizabeth, I'm saying to you specifically, I'm happy to pick up that conversation. I didn't want you to think I was turning you away. Yep. And I'll just <laughs> emphasize, folks, if you need Mark's uh, email, just let me know. He's very happy to get emails from anybody on this subject and more. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all in two weeks when we will uh, take this slow motion train wreck to the station. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> train wreck? Wait a minute. And let me say, when you say I'm willing to get emails on all this and more, I don't do taxes, Michael. Let's just make it clear. All this and <laughs> Thanks again. And everyone, have a good night. Stay healthy. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. See you in a couple weeks. Oh, my God.